Welcome back. Let's continue here now. Melinda Gates is expected to deliver the 13th Desmond Tutu International Peace Lecture at the Cape Town International Conference Centre. The lecture will also serve as a tribute to Leah Tutu's 90th birthday. There will be an exhibition celebrating the extraordinary stories of the many women who contributed to the anti-apartheid struggle with a focus on 90 stories. Welcome. Uh, we are coming to live from the Desmond and Leah Tutu Foundation headquarters in Cape Town CBD. Of course, uh, this is uh, where the processes and events are starting uh, for this year's 13th uh, version of the Tutu uh, International Peace Lecture. Of course, uh, this year's uh, keynote address will be delivered uh, by international philanthropist uh, Melinda French Gates. Uh, she joins me now and uh, we talk uh, about uh, how did you feel you know, when you were invited to deliver this year's uh, lecture. Oh my gosh, completely and totally honored. I mean, what Tutu stands for all over the world and what he has done for peace, just to, to be able to give this, this talk tonight, just I was completely honored and touched. You do a lot of work in Africa um, with a big focus uh, on areas of hunger, poverty, and uh, you know, health care. Are, are we seeing that the governments of uh, African countries are doing enough to actually assist uh, these non-governmental charitable uh, work organizations? Mm. Well, you're absolutely right. The, our foundation does a lot of work around the health system and around hunger and then education and economic opportunity because that's what most families want, right? They want to be able to grow up healthy, feed their children, get them a great education and then have an economic opportunity to live their dreams. And what I would say is that, you know, Africa as a continent had been making substantial progress around a lot of those issues before COVID. But COVID has made things really hard on governments. A lot of the African governments are in debt. And I think, you know, they're turning to institutions like the World Bank and the IMF to say, help us with our debt so we can invest in our people. So I would say not enough is being done, but a lot of it is because of the economic shocks that came from the COVID pandemic. As the you know, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates uh, Foundation, mm -hmm. uh, do you think we'll get to a point anytime soon uh, from not hearing that the people are living on less than a dollar a day? Well, again, the world was making huge progress on that before COVID. And so I think it will be beyond my lifetime before people are living on, let's say, less than $2 a day. My, I certainly hope people have more than even $2 a day. But I, the thing I think I want people to know is that progress is absolutely possible. You know, if we invest in the right food systems, the right seeds, seeds that are drought resistant during climate, help people understand, you know, drip irrigation and how they can use water more efficiently, we can get there so that families can not only feed themselves, but put their crops on the market, right? And, and sell things and then create businesses of their dreams if they have their economic opportunity. Now, you've also been uh, quite uh, you know, active in the area of uh, fighting gender-based violence as well as child marriages. Mm -hmm. What kind of programs are you engaging on in terms of trying to minimize uh, this scourge? Mm -hmm. Well, part of the reason I'm so involved in child marriage and gender-based violence is these are two of the biggest barriers that hold girls and women back. When, you, when a girl or woman is put in that situation, if it's a child bride, we're locking her into a cycle of poverty. If it's gender-based violence, we are taking away women's voices from them and traumatizing them. And that just shouldn't be. And even Desmond Tutu knew that. I mean, he was the one that's helped found originally the elders, Girls Not Brides. So I'm very involved with the civil society piece of this. It takes many pieces to take down these barriers, but the civil society pieces of teaching people different ways, different cultural norms. That's very local work. And I was out to see that in both Malawi and here in South Africa in the Cape, because I think it's so incredibly important. Do, do we have a sufficient uh, legislative framework to actually curb uh, these, uh, you know, this, uh, this, uh, these conditions, given that uh, countries tend to operate on you know, different legislation regimes? And you find that countries like Lesotho and in some parts of South Africa, these kind of uh, things are quite acceptable. But on a broader scale, they should actually be completely eliminated. Do you think that there should be a uniform legislative framework? Mm. 
Well, let me start with what you said near the end there. These things are unacceptable. No child, no child should ever be married off. No woman should be raped in a park, ever, ever. So is the legislative framework strong enough? No, it's, as you said, it's stronger in certain places than others. But the other thing we're not doing is we need a common legislative framework and the Clooney Foundation for Justice, that's one of the reasons I'm traveling with Amal and support her work, is we need to have the right laws on the books, but we need to prosecute. And we also need to get rid of some of the discriminatory laws. The fact that a woman here can't name her perpetrator until he has been taken to trial and the trial takes two years, sometimes eight years, we ought to be able to speak our truth. This is what happened to me. So I think the laws need to be strengthened and I think the prosecution needs to be strengthened. Are you lobbying, let's say, multilateral institutions like the United Nations to actually you know, have a targeted focus on this kind of problems and challenges? I speak with different people at lots of different levels about this issue. Um, and yes, many inside the UN, UN women and others. And really what I'm there to say to them is, look, we need to take down the barriers for women and we need to lift women up. Because when we lift women up, when we invest in their health, we invest in good schooling, we invest in economic opportunity, guess what? Life gets better. It gets better for the family, gets better for the community, and it gets better for the world writ large. And we know that now. You know, if you go back 20 years ago in global development, we didn't have good data about women. We had no data about girls, none. Now we have the data to prove you make these investments and guess what, here's what happens. And so I want to make sure that people realize we need to take down the barriers and lift up girls and women because they'll lift up everybody else. You're also quite passionate about the issues of climate change and climate transition. Now, as we head towards the United Nations Climate Change Conference, COP28, later this month, what are you hoping that our leaders can come out uh, uh, having declared or having resolved one at that conference? Well, at that conference, I think many things need to be done. But one of the ones that we are going to highlight the most as a foundation is adaptation. There are already so many people, take this continent or in Southeast Asia, even in my own country, we're all facing the effects of climate change. We're seeing more cyclones, we're seeing more floods. But who's affected the most? It's the farmers on the continent of Africa. And they've been telling us for 10 years, you know, the rains are coming differently and they're flooding at different times. We need to make sure the adaptations are, are there and are available to farmers, drought resistant seeds, flood resistant seeds, and that they're there en masse so people can still have an economic opportunity, not just to feed their family, but to put crops on the global market and have a good livelihood. Are you saying that uh, developed countries are actually playing double standards or being hypocritical? given that they give aid or funds um, to uh, the less developed countries to actually make this uh, uh, climate change transition, but yet on their end, they are not going as fast as their counterparts as the developing countries. Are you seeing that there is an equitable commitment to actually you know, reduce these carbon emissions? I'm not seeing an equitable commitment. I mean, we have to be honest about this. It's the high-income countries that have really created this problem, including my own. And, you know, we're turning and saying uh, to many low-income countries, well, these are the things you need to do. Yes, some of those things need to be done, but we have to help with the investments and, and not have a double standard. And so I think the world needs to come together if we're going to solve this crisis that we're truly in as a globe. And what would be your message to the leaders uh, at COP28? Well, I would say focus on adaptation right now while we come up with innovations as a world to bring down some of the carbon emissions. Focus on today's problem. Focus on adaptation. And guess what? Don't forget the women. If you look at this continent, Half of the continent of the farmers are women. That's their biggest economic opportunity. Let's make sure the right tools and seeds get in their hands and let's make sure their voices are part of this process because guess what? They are agents of change and they will help us. Lastly, we're seeing a lot of pockets of conflicts across the globe and some wars erupting in some parts of the world. 
as the Bill Gates and uh, 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 Melinda Foundation, it, it, is there a way that you know charitable organizations like yourselves can actually assist in those uh, you know, areas in this conflict? Well, let me just say this: the areas where there's conflict are heartbreaking. Heart all the families who are involved. And I go back to the first principle of our foundation, our founding, and, and what we stand for is that all lives, all lives, no matter where they're lived, should be treated equally. And people want to grow up to have a healthy and productive life, and they should. So what we try to do is continue to help fix health systems, help fix education systems, help fix economic opportunity, and call on rich world governments to help and to fund these things so that people can lift themselves up where they live and then they don't end up in some of these conflicts that we're seeing that are breaking out all over the world. Do you think there's end in sight? End in sight for what? For, for these conflicts, I mean, given that I mean, other countries are also you know, taking sides in these conflicts, mm. which makes it a little bit difficult to come to a speedier uh, Let's say this, conflict is always difficult and we all have to work towards peace. I mean, I think that's what Desmond Tutu stood for. When I look back and I've just toured, you know, the Desmond and Leah Foundation Museum, um, it wasn't a given that South Africa would, it wasn't at all a given that it would be a peaceful transition. It took the right leadership and it took the right moral authority and the right courage. So I always remain hopeful. I think you have to, even in the darkest times. Um, and I pray for peace for, for the leaders and for all the families involved. All right, thank you so much for your time. And thank you. Gates, all the best day in the good work that you are doing and uh, we we'll hope to see you back in South Africa sometime in the near future. Mm -hmm. Thanks for having me.